We are in El Mirage, Arizona. Kevin Marty of Marty Auto Works has invited us down for his grand opening of his Ford service department. This is the world's only Ford service uh, recreation uh, of a 60s dealership service department. So let's go on inside and see what Kevin has to show us. Now, we're kind of pretending that this is a Ford dealership about 1970. That's roughly the idea uh, behind this place. Uh, you walk in the door, if you're one of the workers, you, uh, you pulled out your time card and you used uh, this time clock machine. Some of you remember this sound. The, uh, yeah. It, when 1955 came about, that's when Ford decided to switch to, uh, uh, to a computerized way of doing business yeah, and and what they started doing you know, when they would take orders in from from dealers is they created the idea of a vehicle order image and they would punch it on a on a machine like this the IBM 129 and this is what one of the cards would look like you know, when it was done a vehicle order image card it's the very data we now get from Ford in order to produce the Marty reports that we do. Unfortunately, they kept back then, uh, memory allocation was so expensive that they kept throwing the records away because they just could, they couldn't afford to store that stuff. The, uh, it's amazing that the, uh, the amount of space that's in this phone, if you were able to get the amount of space that was in this phone back in the 60s, it would, this phone, it would have cost $16 billion. Back then it was $1 for one byte. That's what it costs to store. So that's why they threw the stuff away up till 67. 67 is when they finally started saving it. Anyway, then this is, uh, this is the machine that they would use to punch out the door data plates and the owner cards and then finally this machine is a build sheet machine. You know, they, they would, there would be about a dozen of these stationed throughout the assembly plant and it's that that was used for the assembly line workers to know what springs to put in the car, what shocks, all the parts to be able to you know, assemble the car. Anyway, moving on. The idea is this is you come in, there's a service area, a waiting area, new car area, service department. So I, uh, I get behind the parts counter. There are things like back then when you'd order parts, they'd get delivered in these real heavy crates. This is actually an original Autolite crate that parts would be delivered, you know, delivered in. The, uh, you know, back then, Ford, Ford went through a few name changes. They originally would use this Fomoco style up through about 62. Then they switched to using Rotunda up through about 69, then they switched to the more familiar blue Ford. One of the ways that manifests itself is back then they'd sell dust cloths and they'd actually bother to put this dust cloth in a metal can, something that you're going to pull out and use once, they'd uh, put in a metal can. So it's got the Fomoco style, then they switched it to Rotunda, then they went to the uh, Ford blue, and then someone finally figured out why are we doing this and they put it in a poly bag finally. Uh, Paints, you know, in the 50s, they started figuring out how to make colors uh, pretty well. So we started getting all of these crazy uh, purples and uh, you know, these uh, light blues and, and such. And then as we progressed uh, on into the later years, by the time we got into the 70s, you know, everything went earth tone. And so everything's kind of green, yellow, brown, which is why we wound up with things like uh, Harvest Gold refrigerators and Copper Tone refrigerators and avocado refrigerators. The, uh, uh, when, we, uh, when we did oil changes, you could actually buy a five quart can of uh, oil. So you just buy the can and then get your filter and you were ready to go. Now, through the years, they switched from metal and then they finally went to uh, paper 
and by the time we're done with our era, then of course, eventually they moved into plastic and, and such. Uh, which came first, Motorcraft or Autolite? It is a trick question. Motorcraft came first. Ford actually started Motorcraft. I have, uh, you know, I have a Motorcraft set of points. They started Motorcraft in 61, and then you know, the next year they switched uh, to a Fomoco, and then they bought Autolite, and then as soon as they, as soon as they bought the Autolite name from uh, Prestolite Corporation, you know, Robert Kennedy, who was friends with uh, uh, Robert McNamara, who had worked for Ford but got dumped because of disagreements about the Edsel program. Robert McNamara was the Secretary of Defense. He didn't like Ford, and so he went to Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General, and got Ford uh, involved in a lawsuit over the Autolite name. So from the beginning that Ford had Autolite, there was a lawsuit that hung over their head, and it took eight years to resolve it, and the re resolution in 1971 was they had to divest themselves of Autolite. So all they turned around and did was changed everything to Motorcraft and continued selling everything. Go figure. Um, these are, uh, the, this, uh, this area gets into things like some of the uh, items. Uh, for example, if you were at a Ford dealership holding a party, you might, uh, you might have these cups that you give to the uh, the customers or, or these little plates and uh, napkins and such. The, uh, I've tried to be as detail correct as possible about the era so even the ashtray has mercury head dimes in it. And there's nothing from 71 or later uh, in here. Uh, this is uh, the performance era for Ford. There's all these things like these dealer planning books for performance, the, the muscle parts program, the uh, uh, down at the, uh, the bottom here uh, you see some of the accessories that you could uh, that you could order that that were just dirt cheap, or at least that's relative because people made two to three dollars an hour, so this stuff was really uh, kind of pricey uh, at that time. The uh, uh, in this area, I've got things like the original license plates that would be stuck on the uh, on the cars to announce the model year. Uh, things like models. Uh, when I was a kid, you'd eat post cereal, and you if you could. Uh, they'd have this little coupon on the back and for a dime you could send it in and they'd give you this, they'd mail you a little box like that and in this case there were like six little cougars that they would give you, you know, with it. Uh, this uh, Cobra, this Shelby Cobra model came with a little record. That little paper thing is actually a, a record. You put it in a record player and it would actually play the sounds of the Cobra. Ford, uh, in about 1961, Ford bought a company called Philco. Uh, and uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, one of the claims to fame of, the, of uh, uh, Ford at that time was the Johnson Space Center was built by Ford Motor Company uh, through their Philco division. So Ford helped put men on the moon, which is why they celebrated that with that particular record. This is one of these uh, flimsy, flexible kind of records, but it's a uh, celebration. And of course, they used it to advertise, therefore, things like the TVs that they were selling and, uh, and their stereo systems and their refrigerators. Again, the, the beautiful avocado refrigerator. This one happens to work. Uh, in fact, I paid 10 bucks for this refrigerator, uh, and the guy forgot to uh, send me that panel. So he turned around, put it in a priority mail box, spent seven bucks, and sent it to me. So he wound up with three bucks for selling me this refrigerator. <laughs> the, uh, uh, this era, oh, uh, you remember the Sony Walkman, some of us? Remember that? Back in the uh, late 70s? Well, Ford had a better idea. They developed something they called the Hip Pocket Record. This is a record player. <laughs> that you could very easily carry around and they would have these hip pocket records which were flexible so that you could like take 20 of these and stick them in your hip pocket pull them out when you got to the beach stick it on your little record player turn it on and watch or listen uh, to, uh, to tunes for only nine dollars and ninety nine cents it was such a successful program it lasted fourteen months as we got into the uh, 
psychedelic late 60s, all the drug use and such, they started coming out with all the crazy colors. So they had this kind of grabber line of uh, AM, FM radios. Uh, anyway, so the stereo systems uh, that were available, the uh, uh, TVs that they had offered, uh, uh, cassettes were new then, Ford was uh, in the game. You may not realize Quadrasonic actually existed back then. They, uh, Ford, through their Philco division, was already offering four speaker uh, system with this little conversion box. The records uh, up here are kind of an illustration of how Ford fit in in society. Uh, a lot of us fondly remember the uh, good old Bill Cosby 200 mile per hour where he does his great imitation of Carol Shelby. Why are you driving a Ferrari? And the, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, anyway, and then we have uh, Ray Conniff, who uh, had Ray Conniff and the singers. A lot of people don't realize he liked to race. He and Parnelli Jones uh, raced this Baja Bronco and won the Baja 1000 one year. The uh, uh, dealers, dealers could, Ford had a program where a dealer could buy these records and then have their name printed and then give it away to customers. The, uh, there were also uh, people that uh, wrote a bunch of songs about, about Mustangs and then put out albums uh, like that. And uh, uh, even if you uh, bought models, like this is a Revell model, and they would give you a little, you know, a little Mustang record. The biggest thing that yeah, that Ford was doing with this though is uh, in 1960, late, late 68 for the 1969 model year, Ford had this theme going. 68 had been uh, Ford has a better idea, that was the intro of Ford has a better idea. In 69 they were going with the idea of the going thing. In fact like the, uh, uh, the race car up at the very top right there, if you look in the stripe at the bottom it says the going thing. So they were using this theme in a lot of their uh, ad material, and what they did was they created a rock group uh, called The Going Thing. This is their Christmas 68 album, then the 69 album, then the 70 album, then Ford was done with the promo and, and dumped them. The uh, uh, eight tracks were popular then. How, how many of us had eight track players? Still. Still, <laughs> of course. The, uh, when you'd buy your brand new uh, 69, like this one with the uh, eight-track player, you would wind up getting this tape from Philco Ford automatically uh, in the uh, in the vehicle. Uh, so moving on uh, then to here, the uh, the banners. Even though I know we're saying 1970, a dealer wouldn't leave up a 65 banner, but I want to be able to show you all the banner the kinds of banners that existed then. So that's what uh, these all represent. The, uh, this was part of their used car program. Ford, Ford called it A1. And they would do things like, you know, you, you can uh, fly high with a, uh, a, car, a used car from Ford. What I always thought was funny was, do you know what GM's used car program was called? OK. So here was Ford saying, our cars are A1. And GM was saying, our cars are OK. <laughs> just OK. Nah, yeah, just OK. Not the best marketing. All right, uh, moving then on over to the service area. This is an original rotunda uh, alignment rack made by Hunter. In fact, just a few days ago, the Hunter representative had been watching this building. He sees the uh, signs going up and he's thinking, oh, I've got a sale. So he, he greets me out in the parking lot and he's got his sales brochure and says, I don't think I'll be interested in that. And he says, uh, well, we've got some good equipment. I said, oh, I, come here. <laughs> and, and he walks in and he immediately recognizes it but of course he also he actually took the brochure back away from me <laughs> uh, we also used to uh, balance uh, balance tires differently they actually would leave the tires on the car jack it up run this up to it and then press this button, to, uh, no, press this controller to actually start spinning the wheel. Now other test equipment that they had back then, in fact uh, one, one that I think is particularly funny is uh, my wife uh, has an Explorer. When that thing was about two years old we had this bad uh, 
whistling noise. We take it back to the Ford dealer and the, the mechanic that was assigned to it says, okay, well, let's take it out on the road. And so we're driving this thing and trying to duplicate the, this wind whistling noise. And he's sitting there in the passenger seat going like, because it was over by the uh, passenger window, and he's sitting there going like this with his ear. And I'm thinking, this is stupid. Because back then, Ford had this little device. You take this, you put a battery in it, you turn it on, you put it in the car, you take this headphone set, you put it on your ears, and you take this little gun, and you aim it at the, the, uh, the window line to find the, the noise. You just watch the meter and listen to the noise. And I'm thinking, no wonder we could put people on the moon back in the 60s, but we can't get back there now. Because we had this technology 40-some years ago, and my new Ford dealer now wants to uh, have me drive around to try to fix the car. Anyway, this is all period kind of equipment that was used for uh, the various kind of testing, the various tools that would have been available to them, uh, the uh, electronic equipment. The, uh, now this particular uh, scope has a, a story that I like. It goes like this. I've been collecting this stuff since I was 17. When I got married, and Shelly and I are on our honeymoon, we went to the Oregon coast, and we're driving along the Pacific Coast Highway, and I recognize, look, in my mind, that's an old Ford dealer. That's the kind of place that I have found this kind of stuff. So I'm driving along and I look over, but I don't dare turn my head because I don't want my wife thinking I'm paying attention to anything but her and our honeymoon. And so I glance over and then I look forward and I don't say anything and she says, yes, we can stop there. <laughs> so we, uh, we stopped and I found this scope. The, uh, that's how a lot of this stuff's been found through the years. It's just, uh, uh, in fact, a lot of times uh, I would go to a place and they say, oh, we had some guy here two years ago. And I found out it would always be Bob Perkins. <laughs> uh, so moving on, this equipment, uh, it, it all functions. The, uh, this, stuff, this stuff actually uh, works. And you know, it's, uh, no, it's, just, it's just a lot of fun to be able to, to present this to, uh, to people out there, to get an idea of this is the way life was 40 some years ago. Now, finally, now, kind of in closing, I mean, the pictures kind of speak for themselves, although if you have any questions for it, these quest these, some of these pictures are meant to provoke discussion and, uh, and wonderment and such, because some of them are prototype photos. Uh, now, the Cobra Jet uh, engine shot, if you, uh, if you think about it, pay attention, you'll start noticing there's some things that are, seem to be wrong with that uh, photo. Uh, figure it out, we can talk about it sometime if you want. I'm done. Any questions? Okay. Uh, again, I really appreciate you all coming. I hope, that, uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your time here. Thanks. <laughs>